Okay, there we go. What's up, everybody? It's Nick from the Comeback Journey Podcast. Here with me today is Dustin Marion from the Airing It Out Podcast. Um, we've known each other for, I would say, going on a year and a half now, and um, I'm super excited to have him on. Um, we've been talking about this for a little while, and we had a little meeting earlier. We had to drive around, get a couple of new cords. We finally have two microphones. We've been working with one the whole time, so um, I'm really excited. So let's just jump right in. Well, thank you so much for having me, Nick. I'm excited to be here. Mr. Nick Lowry in the building. Any relations to Mike Lowry is the question. <laughs> uh, you know, that's my little brother's name. Right. I told him when he was, uh, he's in like eighth grade, I was like, you need to watch Bad Boys 1 and Bad Boys 2. When you walk in freshman year high school, you say your name is Mike Lowry. True <laughs> story. Right that, you know? I think everybody wants to be Mike Lowry. Right. They, looked, they, they looked a little bit bloated in this uh, newer. Did uh, you see it? I seen it. Uh, illegally on a <laughs> website and on top of that i seen it with a camera and i don't know it uh, i think i read today it made 48 million dollars uh domestically so it's doing okay in the theaters but i didn't like it no. i thought it, i thought it was i'm gonna see it just because i have to see sure it. i get it but like the lackluster it's been 18 years yeah. since part two so and i mean it looks like they're making four. Oh. so yeah so that's, sometimes you just gotta stop in your head I guess. You know? I mean, it was funny to see uh, Will Smith kind of, I think he was on Ellen or he was on some talk show talking about how some of his sequels haven't really worked out the way he wanted to. So, but now he's selling out for three and four. So okay, that's there pretty uh, fascinating. All right. So um, it's your first time on the podcast. So what we're going to do is, um, you know, just I just want you to you know tell the audience a little bit about yourself. And um, so we'll start. Uh, where did you grow up? So I grew up in uh, Bronx, New York. Okay. Um, during the 80s and then the 90s. Um, technically, if you look it up on the millennial side, right? If you're after 82, you're considered a millennial. But if you also look to 81 is kind of the cutoff as well. So I'm kind of, I, I think they have it um, even uh, segregated in a different millennial stuff. But anyways, in the 80s, you know, drug was really rampant in New mm -hmm. York City. Um, the 90s, uh, the crack epidemic took over mm -hmm. and it was um, really, really hard growing up in the, in that environment and in that neighborhood. So, um, I just got back from New York, um, a couple of weeks ago. It's a little different, but it's still the same. I call the Bronx, um, Beirut. Um, and, and, and some, uh, for a friend of mine, uh, is from Detroit. So I call that Afghanistan, oh, but nice. yeah, <laughs> but yeah, it was tough. I mean, a lot of bullying. Um, I'm obviously of a wider complexion, mm -hmm. um, but I'm of Puerto Rican, uh, descent. And it it was tough trying to blend in with uh, the minorities because I was never uh, like white enough to be red, white right. or black enough to be black, and so I kind of was in this this weird space of trying to get like approval from my peers, and they I don't know if they really were my peers, which is strange. But yeah, I mean, I grew up in a neighborhood where you would see like crack files on the floor, used needles, all those kind of things, and you know, from a very young age, I knew something was going on in the neighborhood. You know, you'd mm. see guys in front of abandoned grocery stores just posted up right and then people coming up to them and people walking away and you're like well this guy's not uh you know um some kind of a business front but something's going on right. and you would just see like it was just very hustle orientated and so my dad um when he was in his formative years was kind of like the muscle to his brother's uh small drug enterprise um and he ended up getting screwed by them because he had his own problems and his own addictions and so did they but they felt that theirs were not as bad as his, mm -hmm. so they would tell him, hey, we'll hold on to your money, okay? And we'll, we'll give you a little bit to go get what you need, but the bulk of it, we're saving it for you because we don't know if you're gonna go, you know, buy whatever. But they didn't save it for No, they spent, instead of buying drugs, they bought women and clothes mm -hmm. and fur coats and cars and all that other stuff that goes with it. But, um, yeah, and um, it, it was hard also being raised by a single uh, parent um, in, the, in that community because there wasn't that many um, male role models mm -hmm. that you can look to. You know, most of the role models, I always make jokes about it, but my male role models were like, you know, pimps and gun runners and, right. you know, uh, drug runners and all that kind of stuff. So it was, it was definitely a very interesting upbringing, especially uh, the South Bronx is what's known to be the more dicier area, or at least at that time it was dicier because it's closer to Manhattan. Okay. And so that's how a lot of the drugs was getting funneled back and forth. So like upper Manhattan is like Harlem and Washington Heights and Spanish mm -hmm. Harlem. And then you have like the southern part of the Bronx and there's a bridge and 
you know, people would be like, you know, that whole new Jack City movement and, and mm -hmm. things of like that nature, you know. Um, but I would, it, it was, it was very tough. Um, my mom was very fearful of letting us like hang out in the neighborhood and hang out in the streets. Do so you have siblings? Yeah, I have one brother. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, his upbringing was, was probably a little bit harder than mine, uh, just because I, I think right out the gate, um, I knew I didn't fit in. I was very, very different than mm -hmm. most folks. I even fought, which is funny, the whole hip hop movement, because I thought it was a fade or a fad. I don't know how, I, uh, I think a fade is a haircut or <laughs> a push fad, right? Um, a fad is uh, something that's gonna come and go, but it stuck around. And so for him, dealing with that hip hop culture, he was very heavily influenced, whether it was, you know, the music scene or the clothing scene, or even the jury scene, because that whole, like, it's a facade to, 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 to be a, air quotes like drug dealer on the block you know you gotta right, have a nice to car clout and... right and, and is he older than you or younger no than he's you? younger than he's you. younger okay so i was kind of more of like the romance guy you know mm -hmm. i would like take girls and, and hang out with them at the crib and stuff like that and i you know i wanted my like private time so i would kind of kick him out and he'd be like running around the streets which was probably not a, a great big brother thing to do but um so yeah uh Getting back to it, you know, grew up during the 80s and the 90s, seen a lot of people using drugs, seeing a lot of people getting hurt by drugs, mm -hmm. um, especially uh, in that 90s phase with the crack epidemic. I've had relatives who have stole from their family members um, just to get that fix. Yeah, I've been know? there, I've done it. So like I, you know, I... I think the only thing I'm guilty of is like um, maybe stealing a couple of bucks out of my mom's purse for, for some bud, but yeah. never like trying to check a TV to sell it yeah, for $25, I, uh, you know? <laughs> There was one, it's like a, one of my worst moments. I think my mom gave me her credit card to fill up uh, her minivan with gas. And mm -hmm. so I did it, and then I, honest mistake, forgot to give the credit card back, right? And then she forgot about it too. And like a week later, I saw it in my wallet, and I was like, mm, okay, max it out in less than a month, $2,500. Oh, um, what? Um, I was, you know, going to bars, going out to dinner. Mm, okay. I would, since I didn't have any cash, right? I would go to my, my dealer and I'd be like, Hey, I'll buy you groceries. Let's make a Walmart trip. Let me get an eight ball. Do a little trading. And then one night I was out at a bar and the card got declined. And I was like, shh. They caught up to shit. me. Yeah, I know. That was funny. Um, coming back from um, the tough times in NYC, um, I remember probably like the other like, shady or, or scammy thing I did was um, at times it was a little tough so my mom got on welfare for a little bit and she had food stamps so I'd go like to like the local grocery guy and take 20 bucks in food stamps and try to change it for $10 in cash so I could go buy like mm -hmm. you know uh, back in the day I don't even it's so weird now because there's been such a big revolution in the weed game especially living here in uh, Southern California but like nickels and dimes were like a big deal but now that 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 you know measurement they don't even yeah, like I don't move or nickel, sell it I, right like, I know that you can feel like a dime you know but like a nickel bag that doesn't even exist out here right. anymore no and then it was like you know four or five seeds and a couple of uh, branches in there <laughs> just like all packaged up and, and that was kind of my thing but I don't know I've always had like an internal good guy clock even mm. though i've never listened to it as much as i should but i was always i never try to like push You're it to the weird. limit okay. yeah i was like i'm not gonna and, and it's also too i think it's it's a weird thing too when you start to see other people right so like i would smoke weed and i'd be like well it's just weed right but then you would see someone that was on crack and it was like well they're on crack but yet conventionally the gateway drug was weed so i'm sure if you talk to them they started on chronic right and then maybe got out of party and did some blow and then maybe blow got too expensive and so mm -hmm. they, they they switched and then they got lower and lower to be able to afford the habit right and it's just weird i mean for sure marijuana is a gateway drug i agree um i've tried many things because i've tried marijuana yeah and i think that that's you know depending on who you ask if somebody's gonna say it is somebody's gonna say it isn't you know but in my experience and i know plenty of people that can just like smoke and they don't have any interest in doing anything else they just enjoy smoking right but i also know that anyone that i mean in my experience anyone that's ever gone into the realm of harder drugs started by smoking weed and like snagging a beer or a, a bottle from it's funny parents, i wonder know? i wonder if there's anybody who like went right in the gate right like it's like skipped first base you know and then just like go Not for sure a triple out the gate where it's like coke was your first you know but <laughs> you never really hear that story that's what i'm trying to say like right it's gotta be it's, it's i mean that's gotta be intimidating as somebody that's never done drugs before you know to be like oh, you know 
and smoked weed. Like, what did you know? Which, I, I mean, if, and if somebody did that, <laughs> they're a savage, and who knows how far down the line they went, you know? Because if you're coming right out the gate using, you know, narcotics like that, you're... Well, it's funny. I think, like, so, um, you know, the Reagan administration was uh, very interesting because instead of maybe educating um, they just was, went with the slogan of just say no. Mm. And, you know, seeing the, the egg frying on the frying pan, yeah. this is your brain. This is your brain. And this, this is, is your brain, brain on drugs. drugs. I remember the, the quintessential guy, like kind of, they had this like montage where he's running on a track and it kind of blends into him running away from the police. <sighs> and it was like another kind of thing. And like his aspirations might have been track and field, but now he's track and field running away from the police and yeah. he's copying or scoring. But, um... For me, I find it really interesting because um, my dad, uh, talking a little bit about him being, you know, the muscle for his uh, brother's small time, you know, whatever, you know, enterprise. Right. He fell in a really bad hole. And I think that watching him kind of go from marijuana to the heavier stuff that he got himself into, it kind of kept me grounded in my earlier years. So mm -hmm. like... If, let's say I started smoking, I don't know, which is kind of crazy because in New York, everything's so fast. I sit down and I think right now how kids are consuming media and it speeds them up. And then like for me being in New York, that thing, that, that New York minute is crazy. So watching him, I probably started smoking weed 12, 13, 14. Okay. And I stuck with that for like 15 years. Okay. Because I was afraid. Yeah. Right. I'm like, well, if dad's doing that and dad's first was this. Right. Then it's a slippery slope, mm -hmm. you know? Um... I stood for it for as long as I could and then I started getting in the restaurant business and the restaurant business I think is synonymous with the back end nightlife oh, right 100%. so it's like I go ham for six eight ten hours and then I go ham again not for six hours I mean it depends Maybe, on what bitch but yeah, yeah you're wrong. but like for me there's always that after after work get together let's take some shots or you know you're or, trying to get the edge off because you right. guys are so hyped up right um but then for me I think like around 24 25 I tried um uh, ecstasy for the first time and that I think was my first kind of like switch over into kind of the big boy you right. know area mm -hmm. uh, 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 of things and then it wasn't later until like after my 30s that I tried uh, coke and started to look into that a little bit more but even that it just is it's really never I, and, and, and it's crazy like I wonder if my dad was more wholesome if maybe I would have took a different path where I would have started like going into a lot more a lot earlier. Mm. But that like I said, that experience grounded me. So I didn't I didn't really go off the handles. And I still um for the longest time stood with just marijuana. Mm. Because I mean, I think it gets the job done, right? Yeah. Like for the value in the equivalent versus like I mean I was just, my mom was just telling me a story about some folks who kind of got kicked out of the crib because they got a nasty coke habit. So, like, you don't really hear people, like, losing who they are, losing perspective and all this stuff normally on just weed. Right. Just, versus the worst coke thing, and other The things. worst that you hear, you know, regularly would be like, oh, this lazy motherfucker is just going to sit and play video games all day. Or, like, he sleeps in, he wakes up, he smokes some weed, and then he just sits on the couch. Like, which... Obviously, it's like not the best, most productive way to live your life, but it's not. It's kind of harmless. It's not a regular occurrence for somebody to be like a pothead that is completely devastating their entire life, right? Due to that, hundred percent. But it does have some of its downfalls, right? Which is for me, not becoming more of an adult, um, I'm realizing that I can't really be as like. Um, for me, it creates a hangover now. When mm. uh, like I was younger, I was more resilient. So you know, right. I could party all night and get up and go back to work and maybe mm. do a double. Where now, if I go too hard, I'm like, oh my god, you know, I'm, I'm dreading it and like I'm yeah, dragging. Yeah, like groggy and you're like, yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. And so for me, I mean, it's fascinating uh, to see what cannabis has done in the sense of changing uh, for for medical reasons. But all overall, I mean, I'm not gonna say drugs are bad, but they can be not only deceptive, but they can uh, discourage your inhibitions and your ambitions, you know, mm -hmm. where you're trying yeah. to do stuff and be motivated. And I feel like, for me at least, pot doesn't do that. I think that's the case with, with a lot of people as far as, um, you know, your inhibitions go out the wind or you're, you're not as ambitious as you once were. But that's the thing where, you know, there's a lot of people that, that will say that weed 
heightens their um, creative mind, right? And, it, and and we were just talking about this earlier, how like sometimes, you know, when you're sober and you, and you wanna, you're trying to like work on something like a project or whatever, it's on occasion for certain people, it might take a lot longer to get out this idea, right? On paper, how you, exactly how you want it. Whereas, you know, if you're stoned, you're just like, oh, this is really cool, you know, boom, 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 and, then, and then an hour later, it could be done, right? And this isn't obviously the case every time, but it, it happens. And I noticed that a little bit. Um, I used to, um, I used to write lyrics all the time. Mm -hmm. I, and I rapped mm -hmm. a lot and, and freestyled and all that. And it's a lot of fun. And I still do it, um, not as much as I did, but I find that when I actually sit down and put time into it, my lyrics are better now. And I think that's partly because maybe I have a clear mind, but partly because I'm learning to recognize and I'm more aware of what is going on in my life. I'm more receptive to these outside um, variables that, that play a part in how I live. And it's, it's crazy to think that, you know, a lot of people will say that when you get sober, life is just boring and there's nothing to do, blah, 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 which is, sometimes it's the case, you know, but like if you don't, Tell me about you it, gotta, you, you, you gotta have, you know, these productive hobbies and you have to keep yourself engaged and mentally and physically. And if you don't have that, then yeah, you're going to be bored, but you could also, you know, smoke weed and, and not do shit either. And, and you're going to be bored, you right. know, but you're high. So like, you don't really notice right. it as much, you know? <laughs> it so it's like, matter. it's, and that's the thing is like, there are people that can recreationally use substances and they're, they're fine. You know, like every once in a while, go out for, you know, like once every couple months, you go out for a drink, you do a couple lines, whatever, boom, no harm, no foul, right? right? I don't have that ability. Right. I have <laughs> all or nothing. Zero, right. There's no moderation with 100%. me, you know? And um, I recognize about that about myself, which is good. And I, the people that can do it, more power to them. I wish I could. I wonder if it's, a, if it's a thing where... I mean, I've, I've, I have been with uh, folks that do it like that and their money, but I feel like that's a small group, right? Very because true. even if they might start out like that, I think the overindulgence might get you to the point where you're not right. well, that's doing it. That, that's what that self-awareness has to be. Right. Yeah, right. You yeah. gotta be like, you gotta check yourself and you gotta make sure that you're on top right. of it. Otherwise, it's a very slippery slope. A hundred percent. It's so easy to fall into that recurring pattern and it's like oh it was once every couple months and now it's once a month and now it's every weekend and now it's every time i don't have to work or maybe i, I find it sick today and i know. find it crazy because um being in the restaurant industry as long as i did there's a couple of, of uh running like jokes that i have and one of the running jokes is like the beer muscles right so it's really crazy how the beer like muscles yeah because you feel the confidence right right and, and usually dudes that I, I call it beer muscles because usually when people get fired up and their life is not great they're ready to get into comfortable action right right but i think there's a level of confidence that comes not just with alcohol but also with certain uh, uh drugs because you know you might be a shy person but you smoke weed i think ricky williams was a big uh component for that like combating social anxiety marijuana kind of works for because you're mm -hmm. not so worried about what everybody in the room is thinking you're kind of like um that uh cat williams you know fuck those goddamn lights type yeah. of shit. <laughs> <laughs> take a puff and light candles and shit so you don't have to pay your 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 your, your uh, electrical bill but there is a level of demise i think with it and and you definitely do i think people not only have to be aware but the self-accountability where it's right. like, is this taking away from who I really am? And is this person, you know, tapping into who I could be? You know, I think it's even more fascinating when you bring uh, psychedelics into the discussion mm -hmm. because it's funny to think how many no's, right? People tell you through your whole life. So you kind of have this like construct of no. Right. And right? what you should do. Correct. And then the moment... It, and it almost kind of, for me, kind of shuts your brain down because it doesn't allow or subconsciously makes you feel like, oh, I can't be thinking about those things versus getting on psychedelics where all your mind is open. Right. And, and everything is and like kind of like, in the forefront. Are you like, if you've, unless you're, you dive deep into yourself and you like unlearn these negative thought patterns, right? Where else are you going to have like a foundation of original thought other than taking psychedelics right. but without without putting in the work of like really doing it yourself psychedelics can jumpstart that and but that's 
like how you said, like we have all these, like society is telling us, no, no, don't, don't do this, don't do that, don't do, do this, do this, do this, don't do that. And you know, I, I've done psychedelics a few times in my life. Um, I did it more so not for like the enlightening experience, but more of like, let's get fucked up. I think that that's a new thing now because previous it was just to get lit, right? right. Or, or most of the circles were that way. And now there's kind of been like this renaissance, like intellect kind of surrounding it where it's like, well, you're not going to use it to get high. You're going to use it to get high, but you're going to use it to get you somewhere else. Right. Maybe, you know, rewiring your subconscious while you're in there and right. facing some of your fears and some of your demons because you don't really have that warm blanket insecurity of telling you the no or the yes or what you should have been thinking about where your brain now is just being overflowed with ideas and right. thought processes that you would have probably never even thought about if you were just sober for the most part. Right. And that's... That's the thing is like you can, you, without any outside substance or influence, everyone has the capability of rewiring their, their thoughts and their subconscious to make themselves be able to, you know, manifest, which manifestation is not just like sitting on the couch like, oh, I need a million dollars. It's going to come to me. Yeah, the you secret. Can, right. You can manifest, <laughs> but you got to like, you got to map out an endpoint. Right. And then you got to work your way backwards right the re re reverse engineering right, of it, reverse engineering sure. and, and and how can i how can i manifest this into existence not just like it's going to come to me because i'm awesome i think that the word uh manifest probably is what is the most confusing part because i think people think like when you say manifest it kind of like magically happens right right where sure there has to be like a conscious thought about hey i want to be x y and z mm -hmm. but you also have to be a bricklayer and put things in place and put hard work right. and like dedication and self accountability and all these other things that go with it with not just like imagining or right. um, envisioning right. where you're going to be. And that's the other thing with the, with the brick laying is like some of those bricks are going to fucking fall. Right. You that's... know, and, and they're not going to all fit together perfectly the first time you do it. Right. It's uh, like the first time you went on the basketball court and shot a basket for the first time. I'm still pretty bad. Right. <laughs> Yeah. The first, the first hundred shots you take, none of those motherfuckers are going in unless right. you're born a prodigy, right? But those are crazy outliers. But when you're a kid, you practice like that's, and that's that's one thing that like as a child, I think is society teaches us that is helpful is like practice, practice, practice. Like that's how you get the kind of stuff hard. like that, right? right? Yeah, that's, that's, that's how you learn. But as people get older that I've, I've noticed and not everyone is like this, but there are all these people that are like, I'm going to, I'm going to go in and I'm going to do this and it's going to be perfect and it's going to work out and I'm going to hit this goal and they start and one thing goes wrong and they're like, Oh, fuck it. I'm done. In my journey coming back, um, there's a gentleman, um, that I like, uh, listening to and, um, he talks about how sure make your plan, but also give me five reasons of what you're going to do when it goes wrong. Right, right. Like, that way, contingencies. Right, be grounded. Right, you know, not not everybody's gonna right out the gate hit it and 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 it be effortlessly and 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 nothing really come harmful to the um, outcome of what you're trying to do. Right, and I think that's like something that that I'm for sure guilty of is like fear of failure. Like I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I was like I just finished watching. Have you seen the movie Nightcrawler? Uh no. Um, wait, is that with um? Jake Dylan Jake Hall. Hall. Yeah. yeah. Where he's the... Uh -huh. going yeah, 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 yeah. So the greatest line in that movie. I mean, there's a lot of great lines. If you want to watch a movie, that's a really, really good movie. I, I was hoping he won the Oscar for that performance. But the greatest line in that film is fear. False evidence appearing real. Yeah. Which is crazy. Yeah. Right? Because fear, you just put it in your mind. Right? Like, you're only scared because it's almost imagined. Like, it's, 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 it's made scared, up. You're scared of the unknown. Right. Because you don't know what the fuck is going to happen. My problem is I'm afraid of like being a beast. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, for real. Like, I'm, like, I'm so nervous that I'm like, man, if I blow up, right, all this other stuff is going to come. Am I ready for that? That's right. Like, I'm afraid of, of the true level of success. So that's the other end of the spectrum. Um, I had uh, my buddy Cody on here. I think it was like the second episode of this podcast where 
he that this quote where it says, um, you know, our, our greatest fear is not that we are inadequate, it's that we are oh, powerful. I love that. Measure. I love that you one know? so and, much. And that's, that's uh, I forget what basketball movies that's from. That's from uh, uh, Coach Carter. Amazing. Yeah, My Carter. mom loves that movie <laughs> because it's so great right. because of that. Right. You know what I mean? And, and it's it's crazy to think that. Then those and those are like the two. Those are the two ends of the spectrum, which is like you're afraid that you are a failure, or are you afraid that you're gonna like reach and that, and that's the thing is like you have to find your movement within that and you have to be able and that's this is something like this podcast took me a long time to start and i you know i slacked off on it for the last six weeks i had a lot of stuff going on in my life and i was making these excuses like oh blah 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 and then i got scared of like i don't i don't even know exactly what but it was like i was i was afraid to continue because i had already like put it off for so long and and you know the the thing is, you just have to do. You just have to do it. And and but the baby Yoda, right? No. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you just rub, but like you. But just it's have, facts. You just have to do it, and right. then you do it again, and then you do it again, and then you do it again. I then, also think too um, something that you touched on. When fear kicks in, like you start something and then you kind of backpedal. I think it happens a lot, especially with people that go to the gym. They'll go for a couple of weeks, they fall off, and then it's like, well, I fell off, so now I can't go back. Right. It's like. No, 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 You can go back. Like, you're putting so much pressure on yourself to be whatever it is you're right. trying to be. Like, just get back in the building. I mean, it sounds corny, but turning almost 39, showing up is a huge portion of that. And, and like, to elaborate. So when I hear That's that, I think that it's so weird. I'm like, what does that even mean, right? Like, me. It's almost like someone saying, hey, you have potential. That's kind of like a, an open, uh -huh. kind of, like, empty sentence, right? But when you can go in and show up, show up means... Do it over again. Go back to the gym. If you fell off, you try again. You keep going. You keep pushing yourself. And eventually that you'll get into a space where you get more comfortable. And even if you slack off for a day or two, you already have it in your system that it's going to go right back. It's going to pull you back into it. But again, like we were talking about earlier, it's like, you know, the base of the pull, I feel, is the why. Right? Mm -hmm. It's like, why are you doing this? Why do you want to be in shape? Why do you want to start a podcast? Why do you want to be sober? Right. Right. Not just doing it just because, or a lot of people that I know, for example, in sobriety, do it for their significant other, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a dangerous thing Doesn't in my work. opinion. Because it's, it, it, the moment it, you guys fight, right, right. you go right back down. Mm -hmm. And I, I love the term backsliding. It sounds like something you do at a ski resort, but <laughs> it's really not, right? <laughs> it's you falling out of the goodness that you were trying to accomplish. Right. And here's the thing. Here's the thing with that, because I tried that. First time I went to rehab, I went because my ex girlfriend, we were together for a long time, and I was living this like double life. And when you find out about it, so I went because I wanted to appease her and my mom. And um, it doesn't, I didn't like, I took it seriously enough to get them to believe that I was taking it seriously, but it, but I, it was more of like, uh, okay, yeah. I'll, just sure. enough. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Just enough right. to get me in the door of rehab, stay for rehab. I was there 45 days and I got out and I didn't even make it to 60 days. The day I got out of rehab, the day before my birthday, this was 2000 and birthdays are dangerous by the way. Yeah. For so people that are trying so, to be sober. So this was 2015 and I got out on June 4th, 2015. The next day was my birthday and I went to the bar with my girlfriend at the time. And went home. No, I just had a few beers. Okay. And I was like, as long as I'm not racking lines in the bathroom. Right, I'm, I'm good, okay. Right? Yeah. You know, it's I, so funny I, how I, you start I, to like convince yourself. Right, I'm going right? <laughs> to okay, right. I didn't and do it, that whole bag of blow, but I just drank some beer. So I'm right, 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 right. Exactly. That's exactly what I did. Right? right. But inside of 60 days, I was using again. Right. And and I just went in this massive two-year spiral of like, it just got worse and worse. DUI, I've been in charge, all this stuff, right? And then 2017, I was like, fuck. What am I doing? You know, I'm living at my mom's house. I'm unemployed. I'm I putting my name on the orange shoes now. <laughs> <laughs> right? Bob, don't touch my orange shoes. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, what am I? But, like, I was on the verge of getting kicked out. I already knew, you know. But, but I, I God bless was, moms. They, they give right. us so much. Right. Yeah, enough rope to hang yourself with. Right. Oh, almost. Right? You know, the first time when I, when I went to rehab and then I, I got out and I relapsed and I was like at my mom's house and, and she was like, you know, you can take my car to go look for jobs. And so I took her car and then I 
kept the car and went to my buddy's house. And Sounds like the credit card story. I, was, I would drive around <laughs> and smoke cigarettes in the car, and she hates cigarettes. And I know she does. That's the number one rule. Don't smoke in the car. I come home at 5 o'clock in the morning, sleep Recap, in the house, yeah. and I go in and I wake up at like 7 o'clock. My bedroom door is open, and my mom is taking all my shit and throwing it out the front door. And she was like, get out of my house. Uh, 2017, what, January, mm-hmm. February? This was, this was 2015. 15, so okay. this was after the first time I went to rehab. And, and, and this was like, uh, I don't know, August or September. Okay. A few months after I got out of rehab. And, and, and I was like, where am I going to go? And she was like, I don't know. You can go to all these friends. You're doing drugs. How's that? And I go stay with them. And I, you know, I didn't. And I was like, mom, like, can we talk about this? And, and she was so upset. She like turned and she was like, don't touch me. Don't come near me. Get out. And I was like, fuck. This is like 7 o'clock in the morning, two hours of sleep. Blah, blah, blah. You know, what am I doing? Call my dad. I haven't talked to my dad in months. I walked. He was staying on a friend's living room couch. I stayed on the other couch in the living room. At my dad's that friend's house. That happened not far from the tree, right? right? Isn't that right? wild? And then, and then he brought up this idea of like, let's move to Illinois. Because both my parents are from there. I think my family was like, sounds like a great idea. I'll start. You sure it's not Illinois? <laughs> 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 uh, but I, I, you know, I moved out there and I thought, I'm gonna outrun my problems. And it turns out those motherfuckers follow you. How was it out there in the Cold beginning? Cold as shit. Really? Yeah, I moved out there in November. So, like, to the burbs, right? Oh, I no. Was, I would, no, I was in. Uh, like, country more? Just Champaign, Urbana. So, like, the only thing around was the University of Illinois. Other okay. Other than that, it was fuck cornfields. Jesus. And, um, and I was there for five months and I was like, nope, I'm coming back. back. Yeah. Okay. Month later, did you stay sober the whole time you were there? Oh no, I found a dealer inside of two weeks. My man, (laughs) I was working at Starbucks in the mornings and I was serving and bartending at night and uh, just do blow after work, stay up, meet with my dealer before I had to go to Starbucks at six o'clock in the morning, get more, and stay up all day. I can stay up like two, three days at a time. That was wild. Crash out on my day off. I'd like miss shifts at Starbucks, no call, no show, but I was such a good employee that they, my manager was like, I know you're working, you know, three jobs, it's okay, you know, we're, we're going to let it slide, blah, 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 and then eventually I got fired, you know, because... Right, there's but, only so um, many times it could save you. Right, but, you know, it's, you just, you can't do it for anybody else. Right. And, and that, that's for anything in life. Like, if you... Right. Like this podcast, I was like, okay, like I'm going to get all these little ducks in a row and I'm going to blah, 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 blah. But like, who's going to come with me on this and who, you know, a little Jim McGuire action. Right. But, I, and then I was like, you know what? F it. I just got to start. Yeah. And that's it. That's the, that's hardest, that's part the hardest part. That's and the hardest after part. that, right. it's momentum, momentum, momentum. And then you're in this habit of like, you're going to do it. And that's all you need. You just have to start and you just have to go, you just have to grind through the bullshit and realize that you're gonna fuck up and you're gonna fail. And if you continue after you fail, then you know now how not to do it. And that's something that I take seriously. And I'm not quite to the point of like, I'm gonna do everything that I'm afraid of and I'm gonna, you know, chase all these goals and aspirations, which I, like I do, but not... I'm not fully to the point of like, I accept failure and I know that like, that's the only way that I'm going to get to the successful point that I want to be at is through failure that scares the shit out of me. So I don't put myself a hundred percent into it. And it's something that I'm working on because I know that that's the only way. That's the only way. Burn the bolts, baby. Right. So, you know, it's, it's a process, but, um, it's, it's, working and the more that i do it the less afraid i get still scared shitless but i'm not as afraid right. as you know six months ago. right or when you first started or right the right right so what um what is like what's something that you want to do or what what's your what's your plan so uh it's it's funny that you're talking about what you were saying and says so story came up to me um i my biggest fear is failure which is crazy, right? Because, man, I could sit here and, and, and just go off uh, on so many times, like trying something and, and just just eating shit, mm-hmm. right? And then, and then I, I, my, my story to it is like, you know, I, my knee was on the canvas for a very, very long time. And it, being able 
to get up and stand up and, 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 and continue the fight uh, for me got hard just because when it rains it pours and when you when you when you get one hit and you get another hit and then you get another hit and it, and it's funny for me like I was I was talking to to my wife about this uh, today how close you are when you're taking those hits you're like right there you're right so you, you you have no idea right because it's just a small line one way or the other mm -hmm. but yet you take those hits and you don't stick around afterwards and all of that basically all those hits you took were for nothing right right because you quit and then and who it's knows funny if, if you had done it, maybe taking two or three more fucking punches to the face and then you get to the other side of that line. But it's also, I think it's important to like I, I, the way we said you shouldn't do it for anybody. I think it's also helpful to have some kind of lifeline of people or um, at least people that you bounce things off of that are supportive. Right. Right. Because if you're if you don't have that. I think it's it's really hard to do things alone in the sense of like the mental space, right? Right. And it's it's difficult to be able, in my opinion, to kind of split the things where it's like, hey, I want this person's approval, but if I don't get it, I'm still going to keep going forward, right? Right. No matter what. I'm just trying to balance it to see what sticks. Mm -hmm. For me, um, my biggest shot was trying to get into um, the sports game. And, you know, uh, it took me like two years of knocking on, you know, the fictitious doors mm -hmm. and finally getting an answer. And I got in and then I didn't have that right support system in place for me. And so when I started to, you know, at, where I worked at, I was like the oldest intern. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was like 35 in a room of 20 year, a 20 year old kids who knew how to write better than me, who knew how to use the internet better than me, who knew how to you know, um, use a computer faster, social media, and so on and so forth. But one thing I knew that they didn't have was my work ethic, mm -hmm. right? And my passion to go above and beyond, right? right? So I'd be the first fool in the building. Uh, I'd be the last person to leave. I lived in San Diego, and the job was in Irvine. <laughs> right, right? <laughs> so to be the first and the last, that's a lot. Yeah. And, you know, um, not, not only, you know, taking the shots, but I would also drive my boss to LEX. Mm. Because I wanted to do whatever it took, right? You know, and I I locked myself in a room while I was there, uh, figuring out you know how to become an audio engineer from a YouTube, uh, you know, videos on my phone. YouTube is great. It's amazing, <laughs> and just like going through it and figuring it out and messing it out and learning about editing and all this mm -hmm. stuff. So for me, uh, just being able to, you know, get the uh, airing it out podcasts off the ground and building momentum and you know being able to see the sensitive side of athletes that I don't think that's showcased enough because in the world of filters and best you know pictures on social you don't really get to see that there's other people that are successful that have problems I think that people think that only unsuccessful people have problems and that's, well, that's not thing, true that's the thing with with you know, social media is like this, this phrase that gets thrown around all the time is that you're comparing your real life to somebody else's highlight reel and they're going to post the best of the best. Right. They're going to post the best right. of the best right. because they want to impress and they want people to be like, Oh wow. wow this guy's wow, killing wow. it. He's living it. Right. You know, but it's not, it's not reality. Right. You know, like perfect example, me right now, I'm in this apartment. Boom can't afford it i'm moving out because it's too expensive and i'm moving back in with my mom next week and, and i was i was listening to, to to gary today a little bit uh and he was talking about that like in the downsizing right of your finances to try to build something for the future right like you know? i can stay here and right grind and save kill hundred dollars uh, a right, month right or, or right move back home with my mom and you know say this, this is a one bedroom apartment for sixteen hundred dollars a month which, I mean, it's not, not too bad, but it's still a lot. Right. And like, why I have the opportunity to not pay rent right. or whatever minimal amount it's going to be when I move back in. But like, why not capitalize on that now rather than if I keep struggling and struggling and then I'm, you know, 40 years old and I gotta be like, hey mom, you know, like right. I don't want to be there. Me I, no! I would rather take the ego <laughs> shot now right. and, and make this... Um, you know, I was talking to 
my buddy Jeremy and, and I was like, you know, telling him I was going to move back in, you know, two steps forward to take five steps back. And he was like, bro, that's not even a step back. He was like, that's just a smart move. Right. And I was like, fuck you, right? Okay. I know. I wish. <laughs> I wish. I went back to New York and I could, I wish I could move back, but it's, it, it's too cynical there and too dark. So for me to move back home, that's just not an option. But, um, yeah, I, I get it. Um, you know, you have to really, there's just so many moving parts in it and it's a lot when you're trying to like build anything and i think when you're dealing with certain levels of addiction it, it, it's tough and then also mm -hmm. too um there's a part to be said about you know living alone you know you're loading your thoughts you know you yeah. can, it could kind of be self-destructive a little bit where you, you you know you get you get lonely and you start now okay i'm gonna look for some friends and yeah. look for some shorties and so on and so forth yeah and then it just kind of spirals and you're right back where you were at before. right and that's the thing is like I, i've never lived alone before um and it's, you know, it's awesome, but uh, I'm not, it's not awesome enough for me to struggle the next however many years of my life just to maintain that feeling. For sure. Your, you know, I would rather save money than like, I'm the cool guy with my own apartment, you know, and I'm in my 20s. Right. Like, right. I don't give a fuck. I would, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, that, I mean, I, I, that, that, that validation, I don't think it even matters really. I mean, I think it sucks a little bit when you're trying to bring you know, uh, a young lady over, but outside of that, it, you yeah. know, stacking chips is, is, is the end all be all. Cause you got to try to make some power plays in the future. And if you're like, right. you know, bleeding $1,600 a month <laughs> right. times 12, right. Right. That's uh, a lot of money annually that yeah. you're just like throwing away. And I think it's even weirder where it's like, for me, it's crazy because, you know, renting versus owning, um, you know, how much money have you thrown away in renting? Right. right? Where, okay, go home back to mom. Get focus, make a plan, strategize, stack as much, and then instead of maybe in three years moving out to your apartment, you be moving out to your own condo, right? That right. you own, right? And now, okay, you might be paying a little bit more rent, but it's yours, right? And you have some collateral, and you mm -hmm. have like you're becoming a grown up, right? You have some stuff, right? Right? That you can kind of leverage to get other stuff, right? Right? So. It's it, uh, you know, the, the, the whole way the American uh, dream is set up, it's kind of crazy because most of it is through credit, right? So it's like, I got to buy the house, I can get better credit, so I can maybe get the right, loan for I the car, right. and I can get the loan for the car, and now maybe I can start a business, and it kind of all holds in hand, but potentially, you know, you're just leveraging the loans off of one another, right? You know what that's I mean? the thing, is like, there's, like, debt is not always bad. No, 100%, but I think debt is good when you're leveraging it to make you money. Right. Right. If you're if you're buying something and you're not leveraging it, then you're just throwing away money. Right. So that's that that's where like the the separation between like a liability and an asset. A hundred percent. Like we were just talking about this earlier yes. about my car. Right. So I bought this brand new car, brand new. I thought I had like fifteen miles on it mm -hmm. in uh, November uh, two thousand eighteen. It was a two thousand nineteen Honda Civic. I'd had my own car and like eight years and I was like I'm gonna get a brand new car I need validation let's and, go um, you told me at the time before I got the car you were like <laughs> don't fucking do it <laughs> and I went and I bought I put seven thousand dollars down down payment on this car and um, you know my payment is you know four hundred something dollars a month and my insurance is two hundred dollars a month because I'm a DUI and now I'm like fuck I should have just bought a car for seven thousand dollars but you know what that's a lesson learned and, and if I got to sell the car, I got to sell the car. I don't think I'm going to have to now because I'm moving back with my mom. But if it got to that point, like... I mean, it's a, it's a crazy to think that... Um, we were talking about this earlier as well. You know, that it took a $7,000 lesson, right? But being able to be disciplined enough to try to um, foresee those kind of pitfalls and, 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 and handle them a little better and maybe using other people's experiences... Right. Versus having to lose, you know, 7K. Right. So like, you right, know how to do that. Well, <laughs> I think I told you not to mess with it. Because for me, like, not only is a car a depreciating asset, but I like money in the hand, right? Like, yeah. for me, you know, uh, seven racks, that's seven racks. Like, as yeah. moment I give it away, it's like, and it, it's it so crazy. Bro, it takes so much to make a hundred bucks, right? 
So imagine how much it takes to make seven thousand, right? Yeah, and I it, saved for a while for that, right? And and it is it, it's just so funny. Like let's say it took you whatever a year to make seven thousand, you blew it in seven minutes, right? Right? It's just like here or you know whatever the case might have been. Um, but these are things that you have to be disciplined about, and I think that it's hard, especially again when you don't have people in your corner, you know, letting you know, hey, you shouldn't be or you should. I mean, granted, I did say you shouldn't, but <laughs> not everybody, not everybody has that. Um, uh, accessibility to um, right to it to a right uh, not only a support system but a support system that's going to be like a that's a stupid fucking move maybe reconsider not just like your support system that's like cool you can talk to them about stuff but they're also going to be like yeah do it do it you do live your life blah blah, blah. like you got to have those people around you that you trust that are going to check you and they're going to be like look bro don't be a fucking idiot don't get crazy, man. Right, you know? Don't drop seven grand. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but it is what it is. I mean, I think, you know, you, you, you do have to learn. The problem is, and, and this is the hardest trick, when that next time comes up, being aware. And I think you were talking about it earlier to do being in that moment and, and, and being conscious of like, okay, risk versus reward. Is this a calculated risk? Am I doing the best thing? Is this a, a good investment? And, and and just kind of like, you know, seeing the whole thing, because it's so hard sometimes when you're in it, you're so excited about it. And you can't right. see the forest from the trees. And, yeah. you know, and, and also too, the car game is so ridiculous right. because these fools, once they get you in there, they try not to let you out of the building without a vehicle. Right. So, but you know, you, you just, self-accounting is so huge. Um, you, you, you have to like really, really, really sit down and think and, and just be calculated about your efforts. Right, and you gotta like, like have that objective point of view where you can look at it with like without any emotion and be like, okay, and this is like something that's so underrated is just make a pros and cons list and write it down. And just that alone probably will talk a, a lot of people out of a bad fucking decision. You know, if they, that's all you gotta do is just write it down. Well, I have this weird thing. So you know, I think we're talking like impulse, right? And impulse buyers. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know when it happened, but I, I've had a, uh, you know, a couple of uh, rough goes at things and I've been in relationships and they kind of crumbled and my life kind of crumbled with it. And before I was uh, impulse buyer, right? So if I mm -hmm. wanted a pair of kicks, I'd go buy them right away, right? Mm -hmm. But now I have like this weird theory of mine. I wait a day. If I wanted it as bad as I wanted it, the next day, then I'll get it. If not, I won't. And so many times the next day, I'm like, eh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't really want it. You know what I mean? The $250 right here right. versus, you know, these pair of whatever, $250 Vapor Maxes. I mean, whatever. You right. know what I mean? And I think that's another thing too, becoming a, a smart consumer. Yeah. Um, and these are things, like I said, that are not They're preached, not... taught. Like when we go right, into that's school, not the popular route right no, now. right? It's just like buy, 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 mm -hmm. and and for me, I think I'm very disciplined in that in, in, in that regard. I don't just go out and buy stuff. I kind of mm -hmm. sit back and kind of marinate on it because I mean, something as big as a car, I think is it, yeah. it's a huge decision where you just don't be like, well, I'm just gonna get it. Yeah. Um, but you know, like I said, you just kind of kind of have to weigh out all your decisions right you know um and, and it's not just to purchases it's to relationships it's to people you hang out with it's to the decisions that you're going to make picking a job you know you gotta right. try to see what the best play for yourself is moving forward that you're not going to be like trapped in and forced to be in a situation that you don't want to be in right and that's the thing is like planning for those contingencies and, and like you said like being aware and making sure that you've thought at least of like Obviously, you can't think of every possible scenario that's going to go wrong or in your favor, but like at least exploring the idea of what if. And if those if those what ifs are too much to handle, you probably should not take the gamble. So on. it's crazy, right? Um, I love uh, uh, film and TV, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I consume a good amount of it. Um, there's a show called Billions, right? It's a great show. If you've never seen it, you should check it out. Billions? Billions. It's okay. a Showtime show. It's great. Okay, the cast is fantastic. The premise is fantastic. So the 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 main deal for the show is is this um, like wealth management guy, right? And he's playing in the stock market and vice versa. And he has it where his spider sense, right, is dialed in. So let me expand on that a little bit. We all have the spider sense, mm -hmm. right? We, even when you went to buy that car, something in the back of your mind was like, probably not do, right? Yeah. But you don't pay attention. Right. So for me, something that I've been trying to work on, and I even told myself um, it's something that I really, really, a superpower that I just want to max out 
hugely in 2020 is listening to the spider sense. Your mind and your body will not let you do bad things. If you listen. Right. Like something is telling you. Now, you don't have to, but it's so crazy. Like, and, and as I'm getting older, I'm wondering if it's God or I'm wondering if it's my mind, right? Because you didn't think it, but there's that small little voice like, yeah. Hey, you shouldn't chill there. Or have you ever, and, and because you know, you're partying and stuff, have you ever had that feeling when you go into somebody's house and instantly you're like, this is going to be a horrible idea. Right. But you walk right in anyway. And you're like, you know what? To drown out that sound in the back, let me get that beer. Let me right. get that stuff. And then you're like, sorry, bro, you're yeah. done. <laughs> Shut up. And, and, and so that's something that I think that I, that I consciously, consciously I'm mean, trying to work on and I think a lot of people should too because literally your body will send up a message mm -hmm. to not do and the trick of you is like in the show Billions he listens to it and so over time it starts to become like a muscle and it gets good that way automatically you get a bad feeling about something you walk right I think one of the greatest lines to keep it in that movie thing is like the movie Heat if you can't walk away from something in 30 seconds or less you might not want to do it mm. Right, and I think that's a huge thing, right? Because I think when it comes to hot girls, when it comes to parties, when it comes to guys who have access, mm -hmm. you're just so quick to jump into that versus kind of sitting back and being like, wait a minute, it, again, what we were saying, is this a good play? Should I be doing this? Because it's so funny how you talk yourself in and out of things, right? Right. Because you're like, I'm gonna go to this party and everything's like, don't go, don't go, don't go. And you're like, fuck it, I'll go. Yeah. Right? And then you go and like somebody gets stabbed at the party, or gets shot, right. or the police come, right. or you get a fight with your girl, but your internal whatever that is mm -hmm. lets you know like this is probably not a good idea. So I've been trying to to listen to that more because I think, for example, right, in your mind, it's in the same line. It wasn't you that woke up and said a podcast. Something in your brain was like, hey, you have a message. This is a platform. Why don't you use it? Right. right. And you haven't listened to it for so long, and now you're starting to listen. Right. And I think that's Do you remember? Important. Do you remember we were in the parking lot of work? Mm -hmm. And we, I, I was like in my car parked over by, um, by the Albertsons, mm -hmm. and, and you had like walked up, and we were smoking cigarettes. We were both talking about how we should stop smoking cigarettes, and, and you were like, you know that feeling that you get? inside your gut and it's like building and building and you just smoke a cigarette and it suppresses and you were like I want to learn how to harness that and how to like use it in a way that's gonna like be not only productive but in a way that's going to advance yourself and, and to where you can learn from it and use it in a way that's gonna benefit you and like that's I think that anxiety is like you know, people struggle so much with that, and I have to. And, and like being able to, you know, take a breath right. and be like, okay, like this is this is manageable. Whatever, whatever it is, um, like how can I use this to my advantage without just like I'll oh, suppressing it. Like I'll oh, fuck it. Let me just smoke another cigarette. Let me just pound another beer. You know, it's it's. It's a game, man. You just got to learn how to play. A hundred percent. I also think that we're not taught, again, how to manage the mind and all these things, right? And no. so, like, when it comes to uh, self-doubt, right, how do you go about managing that? And I feel like it's so crazy, and, and, and I hate to get, like, religious or whatever, but that inner voice... Like, you already know everything you need to know. The problem is whether or not you believe mm. what you know already. Yeah. Right? Because there's this internal thing that tells you stealing's bad. There's this internal thing that says cheating is bad. Right? Like, you feel it. Even when you... It's so crazy how human beings are. Like, when you do something that's not good, you really feel it. Yeah. At least for me. You can get, like, a physical right. sensation. Yes. That's it like, could be overwhelming. You intense. Yes. You're like... Right. This is bad. Yeah, you get the anxious, the anxiety. Right. And it's, again, trying to channel, channel that. But if you're doing bad things and you're with bad people and that other stuff, and as you keep, you know, self-medicating, that voice or those feelings kind of go away and you just mm -hmm. become numb and you just, you know, you're just out there doing stuff. That's probably not um, in your best interest. But because you've, like, not channel or train your, your position on that, it kind of handcuffs you when you're trying to do other things right and and 
another part of that is like how you said, you know, you, you keep self-medicating, you don't, and you don't learn how to harness that, right? But for me, another part was like I was, you know, doing doing drugs and drinking for continuously for years. That when I stopped, I felt like emotionally stunted like i didn't know how to correctly process emotions or communicate my feelings 100 i'm this is you know coming up on almost three years sober i'm still thank you congrats it's that's still, a big deal it's, it's a big still, deal uh thank you yeah it is it's still not like i still struggle with it you know and that's there's something that like i'm glad that i have like supportive friends that'll call me out and be like bro you know like Let's let's sit down. Let's talk about this. Like, what are you, what are you trying to do here? Like, why are you, you know, like kind of questioning and, and and helping me to like think about things more and to like get more in touch with myself and like why do I feel this way or is this really what I'm feeling or is this what I want to feel because it'll appease my thought process and I won't have to face these negative thoughts. Well, it's weird, right? Because like a lot of people, first of all, I've partied a lot too and I've stopped and started. And I feel like a lot of people that are in that kind of like system and kind of get stuck on that, on that wheel are afraid of confrontation, right? So you don't want to get somebody angry. You don't want to take that difficult discussion. So it's mm -hmm. like, well, if I smoke some weed or if I do some blow, I could probably handle it because whatever comes up, I'll just throw it back there somewhere right. and whatever I'm on, I'll kind of, you know, deal with it. And then, you know, I'm a little bit easier. Like for me, the first few times when I was coming up as a kid, I stopped smoking weed and I, I, it helps with my anxiety. It helps with so many things for me that when I was off it, my mom would be like, Hey, you know, throw out the garbage. I'm going to do it right now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Like, you didn't mean for it to come out like that, but because you're not learning how to deal with your emotions and your feelings and your thoughts, right. when you're on that stuff, it doesn't matter. But when you're off it, because it's been such a huge bandy or a crutch is a better word for right. it, that you don't even know. I could have just been like, okay, but at that time, thank God I was so, I w I've always been um, a thoughtful person that later in the day, I was like, hey mom, I'm sorry. You know, I'm still trying to work with this. This is like a hard thing. I'm, I'm, I'll probably spaz out a few more times. Right. But this is something that I guess I got to go through in the, you know, mental detox of trying to handle certain things and, right. and spazzing and being a high energy person. Because it's so weird, right? Like, this, the psychology of the whole thing is bananas to me. Because I've been at so many effing parties, bro. And you're there and like... You think people are present, but nobody is, right? Everybody's trying to run away from something. So as many people are at it, nobody's even in the building. Right. You know what I mean? And it, it becomes super surface and super whatever, and no one's really like talking about, you know, the things. That's why I think psychedelics are so much more interesting because they actually make you think. They actually make you want to confront all those things that you were harboring or trying to hold back are gone, mm -hmm. right? I was talking to a mutual friend of ours and... Um, I always joke around that I call it the dark I, I call it dark nighting okay. when you're like getting it in and so I always have a joke with people that I'm like hey what's your middle name because I always like giving a name to the alter ego mm -hmm. and for him he was talking about on his alter ego and how he's you know was kind of nervous but I'm like dude when you get on the psychedelics or specifically for me in my experience has been like let's say shrooms acid i think is a little bit different and i don't even know if acid qualifies as a psychedelic it does but, but it's not so much that acid so much more right like it's a totally thing. right it's, it's a so totally different animal bad. and and for him he's like well you know i'm afraid of this person coming back and i'm like shrooms don't do that to you bro the first thing in my opinion that shrooms get rid of is your ego it's like it's all you now mm -hmm. and you can't really defend yourself yeah and now you're open and no matter how, like my um, last um, psychedelic uh, experience, I realized how much of a control freak I was. I couldn't even sit down. I couldn't even relax on the high that I was trying to relax. Like my anxiety went through another roof at another level that had me geeked out. But when I came back from that experience, I was like, wow, I really need to learn how to let go a little bit. I really need to, I mean, Again, to keep it in the same vein with the films, you know, that one of the greatest scenes uh, to me in Fight Club is uh, when Brad Pitt's character is telling Ed Norton, hey, just like go the steering wheel, right? Like, no matter what happens, we'll deal with it. If the car crashes, hopefully because we have seatbelts and airbags, we'll survive, right. right? And I think that's kind of the situations in life. But um, 
it, it, it's, it's crazy that, like I said, you know, you could be at a packed bar, but everybody at that packed bar is not there because they're trying to get better. Everybody's right. at that packed bar because A, they got social lubricant that makes everybody cool, and now everybody's interesting, everybody's mm -hmm. dynamic, you know, you're, you're able to, 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 to be, air quotes, the better version of yourself, which is not true. Right. Because in the morning, you got to deal with all that shit, and you got to have to have a job. Right. And you got to go show up, and you got to, like, you know, not have the bloodshot eyes, and not yeah. have the bags under your eyes, and not be drowsy. You know, you got to go be an effective employee. Right. But when you burn the candle on both ends, you know, it starts to bleed into your real life. And for me, it's just fascinating to see so many people on this crutch, you know? I mean, it, it's, it, it really, really, really is sad. I mean, I think a good portion of my family um, suffers with alcohol and another good portion of the family suffers from, you know, addiction. But I think now as they've gotten older, things have changed. Mm. I think your 20s to your 40s is really where it all happens, right? And you're kind of like trying to navigate things. But I think after 40 hits, like nobody wants to see. I mean, we even make judgment, right? If you go to a party and there's a 50 year old, 50 -year -old guy doing blow, it's like, bro, where, where are you at right now? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> right, right. Like, it's a young man's game, this whole, I don't know, night pursuit of a good time. Mm -hmm. But it's, for me, I think it's it's fearful because a lot of people think that they they are better versions of themselves when they're on it, and that might not be entirely. I'm sure the trouble is right. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, it, it, and it's scary, even for me now. Like I was just telling you earlier, like I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go on this creative thing, right? And I've written sober, and it, and it's going along. Mm -hmm. But I'll, you know, I won't get lit lit, but I'll smoke a little bud. And then it's like, pow, and my brain is open. And I'm like, oh my God, I got all these ideas and I can't even keep up right. my hand to pen on how much stuff is coming through my brain. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 it just is scary. Um, I think how high, did, not how high, um, Half Baked did a really good job in explaining that because some people are creatives. Some people just want to sit on the couch. Some people want to like go outside, you know, and you have like different versions of people that want to be on things when, to be honest with you, I mean, I don't know. There's a lot of people that, that are on the, uh, the trailer of this whole like rec recreational uh, weed movement, but I think that it has medicinal, uh, capabilities. I just think that it's a slippery slope when, you know, you just like, Hey, let's just go ham. And, right, and, right. and, and, it, and it's crazy to think that there's people that are actually considering making other drugs legal and then that whole world starts to become different and then that's a whole nother discussion and a whole nother argument yeah that's you know what i mean there's because branson is all about it did you know that uh richard branson is all about making all drugs legal all drugs there's um i was listening to a pod i think it was on, on joe rogan's podcast he had this guest on and, and this guy was like a border patrol or not border patrol but like worked in like around the border like training special forces stuff like this and he's was like said he's involved in the drug war and he was like i think absolutely it would help to legalize all these drugs and i i never really thought about it but i was like man like for me now i don't think it would matter like it wouldn't be any more tempting right. if it was legal but like right back in like if you could get it at right age right like, if i was like <laughs> or, actively or in it, yes yeah like, actively in it and i could go get that shit legally so there'd be no coming back you know, so that's accessibility, right? Is a huge thing. That's probably why you went to Illinois. You're thinking like, hey, I'll move to the middle of uh, nowhere, right? And there won't be no contacts, there won't be no plugs, and within two weeks, you still found the plug, right? So it doesn't really matter if you're remote or not. Right. The See, accessibility is the most important thing, and that's in that in that particular. That's uh, the thing is like discussion. that's what that mental power is because, like, you're gonna you find yourself where you're meant to be, right? And like, if you are this is, I think, ties back to, like, the subconscious thought. Like, if you think that you're not strong enough to stop, you're probably not going to stop. Right. You know, you got to do the work. And that shit was legal. Whoo! That'd be crazy, bro. I don't know. I don't really have an opinion on it one way or the other. Um, I haven't put a whole lot of thought into it. Um, I've thought about it a little bit. But like I said, I think that's, that's a whole other discussion of, uh, uh, on a whole other deal. <laughs> I, I, for me, the, the, the easiest fix, and we don't even know if that, that would be true, but it would at least be something to kind of neutralize the dealers. But even with the weed game, right, there's still a black market, right? So it's, 
it's legal and I think in Palo this might be a wrong number, but let's say it's 15 states mm. that recreational marijuana is legal. Mm. There's still a black market in those 15 states and there's still a black market in the other, we you know, in, in 37 uh, other, you know, uh, in states, in, if, that, yeah. if my math is even correct. We're in that. San Diego and, and it's get it pretty much fucking anywhere here, uh, uh, like a dispensary or, a, you know, something like that. But I'll tell you this also, though, the, ex the dispensary experience is amazing though, for, for me at least, coming from Bronx, <laughs> the Bronx Beirut status where you're like knocking on a door and there's like a little hole in the bottom and you throw your money in there and the guy throws your drugs back out at you. <laughs> We're being in like this pristine, beautiful loft situation and you're seeing Would like- you like a sample? Right, you know what I mean? <laughs> and it's just like everything that you thought that were taboo is being embraced and is being right. looked at in a totally different way. And I can literally legally take it out of the store, carry it in my vehicle, bring it home and not have to worry, you know, about the whole uh you know illegal portion of that mm -hmm. um because it's crazy when you expand on that the united states of america incarcerates more people for weed charges or marijuana charges than anywhere else and mm -hmm. by the way on top of that too we still incarcerate more people than anywhere in the world mm -hmm. so it's it, it's really crazy to think decriminalizing drugs, um, making it legal across the board. But like I said, I think trying to get it out of the black market would be my one uh, thing that I find interesting in it. But I don't know if that's true because like I said, even with the markets that have been, there's still people that have a black market but still use it. So. Right. But again, I mean, now you have weed delivery and I mean, it's right. it, it, it's insane, bro. And, and I think coming uh, this year, they're gonna try to pass uh, psychedelics in California as well. So, you know, that's, I don't know if it's a slippery slope. Uh, I don't know if it's, you know, good for the infrastructure because a lot of these things are going to be taxed, right? Mm -hmm. And you get better roads and hopefully, you know, uh, better schooling and, you know, your, your city or your state is not poor. Right. And so th there are some positive sides, but, you know, for me, getting back to what you said earlier, I'm a beast, bro. And in that word saying that, it's like, I'm not just gonna have a shot. We're gonna drink the whole bottle. I'm not just gonna smoke one blunt or one joint or take one edible. Let's hold, kill the whole bag. <laughs> <laughs> let's smoke it all. And when we run out, let's go get some more. Right. Right, and so I think that's probably more of a guy thing, right? Like, it'd be really interesting to do like a, a field study on men being more addictive in the sense of like, instant gratification versus chicks, right? Mm -hmm. I feel like women in that regard are taught so much more different, right? Like they're getting so With many more tools. Standards. Yeah, they're getting so many tools so much earlier that maybe naturally they're not becoming addicts, right? Versus us, it's like, here's a Tonka truck, here's a walkie talkie, good luck in life. Yeah. Where for them, they're getting the Susie, uh, you know, bake oven, they're getting a stroller. I they're learning, right, you know, <laughs> But hey, listen, I, I'm not, I hope you, you're you a good breaker now, but you know what I mean? Like those small things, that's like teaching you how to be like a home, uh, you know, like a housewife and, you know, how to be maternal and how to deal with your emotions. It's okay if a girl cries, but it's not okay if a boy cries, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, my, me and my son, I kind of struggle with it now. Like how much no am I supposed to tell him when he's trying to develop his mm -hmm. emotions versus letting it grow on its own, you know, and right. saying certain things, you know, and maybe making certain things taboo in his mind because those are the blocks that you're building mm -hmm. and that's making that small person a person. Right. And for guys, at least I knew for me, it, it was crazy growing up. Like, how old are you again? 28. Okay, so you had the luxury of like the internet at a better version. At yeah. a better version, not a great version, at a better, right? Yeah, I didn't even have the internet, mm. right? So we had to like go out there and like be in the field and learn. Like I didn't have porn and I can like click something and see the whole physique. I had to like <laughs> talk to like 200 chicks and maybe one girl was like lucky enough for me to get with and you know, she was all covered and I, you know, like it was it, it, it was different. And the same thing with, with drugs, like I was telling you earlier about, you know, that whole Reagan administration. I remember the first time I smoked weed, I didn't even know I was doing drugs. What? Right, right. How do you not know? First of all, again, because there was a lack of stuff. So instead of them saying, hey, uh, you know, say no to drugs, they didn't say no to marijuana, say no to cocaine, say no to crack. And I lived, for the most part, because we were in a really bad neighborhood, I lived kind of a shelter life in the beginning. Mm. Um, my mom tried as much as possible. I mean, I remember kids getting killed for their sneakers. I remember kids getting shot for, uh, back in the day, they had like these varsity jackets that were very popular and they had like a stupid eight ball in the back mm -hmm. and guys were getting killed for that. Um, they, I think it's Averix 
I'm not sure, but there was like another like big bomber jackets that everybody. And so like for us, we didn't know. So like my mom never came and told me, hey, you know, not don't do drugs. Hey, do you know what marijuana is? Hey, and I think this is another thing too, that as a parent, you can't be afraid because you're combating the internet. You have to have these conversations with kids now younger, right? I didn't get a drug talk. I didn't at all. Not okay. one, right? I didn't, well, I got one, but after I was already like two years in it. Right, and then I think even like in health, right, where you're getting the drug talk, you're not even getting the drug talk. They're just teaching you how the drug like kills your body and they think that's enough, right? Right, to like basically steer you off of it, but that's not true, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, when I first smoked, I just thought weed was something else. I thought weed was like a different version of a cigarette, I think, at the time, and maybe that got you, because when you smoke tobacco, you kind of get that little bit right. of nicotine rush. Mm -hmm. So I just thought, I never, and when I did, I was like, fuck, <laughs> I'm a drug addict, <laughs> you know? And I just like smoked some weed, right? But it, it, these are the things, right? Like we gotta have these open conversations and, and, and talk to the people, the little people, the, the, and, and I don't mean the little people, I mean like, kids you know what i mean and, and letting them know like hey this is what's up and you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that um but yeah it's 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 crazy to see like the slippery slope you know because i remember saying like i see those commercials and i was like i'll never do drugs <laughs> and that's what i knew when i when it got together that was drugs. i was so disappointed in myself because of my father being who he was it had a fear deal for me i was just like especially in my neighborhood bro like even here, we live, you know, in, in East San Diego, let's say, right? Because people don't like the East County word. They're like, let's go to East <laughs> San Diego. It's not East County. <laughs> right. It's so silly. Um, but even you see here, right? So when you see somebody that's on drugs, right? They, they're usually not in the best luck, mm. right? For the most part, the only thing that looks cool is the dude that does blow, right? Because the guy that's always on blow, that's he always looks good. Mm -hmm. My man is always shaped up. He's always got like the, the, the nice haircut and he got bitties. Because that is, let me tell you something, a surefire way. If you're having problems getting laid, and this is a terrible advocate for this, but if you have cocaine, that's going to change immediately. 100%. You, you're going to have all the chicks you want, I think. And so when you see the pothead guy, he's all dreaded out. You know, like at least that's how it's drawn, it's right? Yeah, 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 you know, he's all dirty. So, oh my God, we, well, marijuana is a dirty drug, right? You see crack or meth or, right, they're missing teeth and they're... But the guy on the blow looks like a goddamn rock star. And he's the coolest thing since sliced bread. And everybody wants to talk to him. And, and it, you know, it's just really weird. That that's the one drug that still kind of has like this pristine kind yeah. of. Well, it, that's that thing. There was like a, a, a meme going around on, on the internet a while ago. And it was like, um, you know, things I found out when I was an adult. Cheese is really expensive and everyone does blow. I didn't even realize it was so funny until I came to California because I had steered so long away from it and I never tried it. Like, you'll be like in a setting, nobody's doing anything, right? And then the moment you like bring out the bag, like it's like, whoa, mm -hmm. like everybody, you're like, damn, you do it too, and you, and you, and you, and you're just like, wow, I would have never known. But for me, I, I, I've tried, I've never done, and I think you find this fascinating because I think I've told you, I don't know, I know but I don't, saying. yeah, I don't, <laughs> I have never put blow up my nose, ever. Just in your mouth. Right, because of the fear of my dad, right? And mm -hmm. he struggled with something that was even more stronger. I couldn't even imagine how to get off of it. But, you know, heroin is, a, is a, like as hardcore as you could go. And like for me, that whole gateway thing, I just got afraid of it. Like, it's so weird. It's like, well, if I do blow, I'm gonna be on crystal meth. Yeah. But it's kind of weird because I ended up getting to the, that avenue at that end. Mm -hmm. And then it was just like, wait, I was trying to avoid that and I still kind of got to that. So I'll be honest with you, I think probably cocaine, I would say is more of a gateway drug in this sense that it makes you feel comfortable with trying harder stuff. Yeah. Right? Because marijuana, you're like, well, I don't know, that blow stuff sounds crazy or this sounds crazy or I don't mm -hmm. know. Like, you know, with the psychedelics, it's like a six to eight hour trip. You're like, I don't want to be that lit. Right. Right. But marijuana, you're kind of cool. You can throw on some Netflix, you buff a little bit, you're okay. Mm -hmm. But I think like with, with blow, even for me, it was just kind of like, well... That was all right. What else you got? Yeah. Right? <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, and then you're like, woo, you're dabbing, and you're just like, you're all over the place, right? And so, I don't know. It's 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 really, 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 really scary. And I'm kind of glad that I have done the self-accounting and I never put it up my nose because who knows how I would be, right? Like, I don't know if it's like easier to jump off that I just gum it versus 
being able to, to, to do it through your nose and then being like maybe instantly hooked because that's what I thought. But when I've tried, it's so weird. I feel like there's so much hype surrounding so many things, right? That when you actually try, you're like, that's it? Yeah. That was it? Okay. So all you fools are lining up for a 15 minute high. That's it? And then you're going to go back for another 15 minute high and then back. I'm like, you know, I'll just stick to this weed thing. It's way cheaper. I get a lot more, right? And the, to me, the thing is thing about other drugs, for the most part, is that you don't even know what they're putting in there. Right. Right? It's like, bro, some of these some of these drug dealers are ridiculous. If anything, maybe cocaine should be legal recreationally. That way it could get better the way they bet marijuana now, right? But you gotta label it. It has to have, you know, yeah, the TC. Right. Yeah, yeah. You you're basically saying like this is whatever, eighty percent pure, you mm -hmm. know? And and maybe that's that's another argument for making it legal that, you know, now it, 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 if you want good cocaine, you're gonna officially get good cocaine. Yeah. Versus, you know, some baby laxative or some powder or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, you would, I think you were talking earlier about um, Mac Miller and he had some stuff and we don't, we don't know what really got in it. But my friend uh, that just passed away, um, he, same thing, he, and I don't know what it was. I don't know if he was doing crystal or whatever, but he was snorting it and he died because it wasn't what it was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because there's That's no... That's the scary part. You know, bro. It's like, fuck, man. I've known, you know, a couple people that have passed away from overdosing and like... This was like even before like fentanyl was like a real scare in you know the street world, um, but even even just you know you just do a little too much even if it's like uncut or like there's no like real bad additives in it like you like you can think that you know your limits but like you might just do a little bit too much and then. That's it. Yeah, it's, it's it's I think that's another thing that's kept me grounded with it. It's a really like you don't you don't really hear of somebody old on weed. You know what I mean? Like yeah. cocaine and, and some of the other stuff. It's super scary because it's just like, man, one more dose that I don't know about it might send me off the edge and then right. you know, who knows what happens. And then it's like this whole embarrassing thing because if you O D and don't die, mom and dad have to pick you up at the hospital. Right. right. Maybe Popo shows up and they gotta talk to you and say, Hey buddy, where did you get this stuff from? And and it just becomes this whole other uh thing. Right. And I, is that scary enough for you to stop? Right. For a lot of people it's not. Listen, man, it's so crazy, bro. Like every time I hit rock bottom, I'm like, This is it. This is as far as I could go. And then I hit rock bottom again and it's even slightly lower right. than I went. I think I mean let's say officially the ultimate rock bottom is being locked up, right? But to some people that's still nothing. And I said, well, right. three square meals, you know, maybe some TV on the weekend. I get a bunk mate, no right. rent. You That's know what I mean? Man. I'll get yoked. Right. Maybe, maybe, get, a, maybe get a master's. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, there's so, I mean, who knows what the jail world's really, really like, but it just seems like people manage. Yeah. Right? Manage whatever. Well, that's the thing is like you get like in a situation where you're uncomfortable and, and you might be uncomfortable for a couple of weeks and then you get used to it. Right. It doesn't really matter what situation you're in. You could be... You know, as long, as long as you're not um, completely void of any resources, like, you'll figure it out. Or, or you'll, you'll find some way right. to get what you want, whether that's legal or illegal. Like, right. however you're going to get it, you know? And, and that's another end of the slippery slope is, like, how far... Like, you lose your pads, or you're living in your car, and then you lose your car. Like, okay, what are you going to do? Yeah. Like to, you know, get you like gonna break into somebody's house. So you're gonna, you know, there's all these scary thoughts that, I know that I'm wild. sure that people have, and and that's that voice that's like, don't fucking do it. But then you're like, mm, I'm gonna do right. it anyways. And right. then, well, because things come out of necessity, right? It's like, well, I'm hungry. Right. I'm starving. I'm cold. Right. I need shelter. I'm gonna break into this shit real quick. I'm gonna have. I'm gonna just take a little right. nap, eat some stuff, and I'm gonna boogie. Or on the back end of that is like. Oh, I really need some more fucking heroin. Right, a hundred percent. You know, you know, whatever, whatever the case is. It like going back. You know, you know, hawking someone's TV for right. you know, you, you take a thousand dollar TV down to the freaking shop and it's like twenty five bucks old. Okay, boom, I got it. Right, and enough to get that. And it's so strange when you look at it, right? Like, because we're talking about uh, not so much, but trying to build things, right? It's funny how much when you're when you're on really heavy drugs, how you're just for the singularity moment. Mm -hmm. You just worried about getting your next high, yeah. and then when you get that, That's the next concern thought. is I don't get any high. Right. And the moment you start to, because I've been there, the moment you start to sober up slightly, it's like, oh, this is not working anymore. We got to get right back to where we were at. Am mm -hmm. I coming back down? Is this crazy? I mean, it's. I think it's really, 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 really insane. Um, 
how, how to manage addiction, how to manage your mind. But I also think that you have to stay constructive, right? You have to do stuff too, because right. um, idle hands are the devil's playpen. And, you know, maybe go to the gym. I think it has to be physical, because I was going to say, maybe recommend getting, you know, a hobby of like reading a book, but I don't think that that has the same traction. I think um, there's something awesome about working out that kind of calms your brain enough, 100%. enough to get you to the next workout. Right. And that's not to, I mean, I, I read all the time. I love it. it. It is a good way for me to like decompress and, and kind of relieve some of my anxiety. But if I'm only reading and I never go to the gym, I'm going to go fucking crazy because I have all this pent up energy moving around in my body. And it's like, where is it going to go? I got to get it out. Right. Right. And, my, and, and the easiest, most productive, most healthy way to do that is just get some exercise. You know, I go for a walk. Just go for a walk. That's it. You could just go for a walk. And that's it. You can do a little mile, a little mile lap, you know? Can you take the, uh, your Fitbit with you, count all your steps? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, uh, I get it. I, same thing with me, though. Like, I'm an all or nothing. So for me, uh, like, no, the minute, the, the mile walk is not going to work. I'm like, okay, let's load up all these plates and let's see if I can do this thing one time. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's just like, woo, that was so hard. But it kind of, like, releases right. so much stuff and so much pent up. Uh, stress mm -hmm. that it's just crazy um, it's just so much more easier to do it with drugs which is I think that's the dangerous part yeah right it's just it's, it's an easy it's, hack it's the easy out right it's like oh well you know what fuck it I'll just you know do right. this and do that and, and I'll be okay and you don't have to deal with anything you don't want to deal with no until you do have you ever had that point where it's like people are starting to leave and you're just like broken hearted that the party's over and you're just like fuck what am I going to do now right <laughs> And we're gonna go back home. I mean, who wants to come with me? <laughs> I think, I think, because you you're, you've been living alone a little bit. I think it gets really, really dangerous when you start to do drugs by yourself. Oh yeah, because then you don't need nobody anymore, and oh, now yeah. you just want to hang out with yourself, and then that's that's enough, right? At least if you have it where you have to do it with people, it kind of controls it a little bit. A but little the moment bit. you switch it and you can chill by yourself, and I used to sit in my bedroom at my mom's house on like a. Wednesday night, you just with an and just sitting there. And, and what would you do? Would you watch TV? Like I would watch TV. I would, you know, maybe play. I think I had video games at the time. I, but is it the same doing video games on Coke? Because I love playing uh, video games on <laughs> Wii. It's amazing. Uh, I don't know. It's it's fun, you know. But because I feel like it's so weird, right? Like I've I've done uh, blow, and it's just like it kind of feels like an uplifting kind of deal, where like. I gotta like I get it why it's in clubs and in like dance things and like mm -hmm. why people want to listen to music. There's something about it that kind of is like okay, let's start moving, let's start doing. Yeah. I get it's like it's like pre right. I guess yeah, in that it's version, it is a stigma, <laughs> right? You know, so it's gonna right. It's gonna be like, all right, here we go. But but I agree that like if you're doing when you start doing it by yourself, like if you're just like driving around and like every couple minutes you pull over and like hit a keyboard, you're just cruising around aimlessly like listening to music and like it's like six o'clock in the morning and the sun's coming up like. And you're like, oh, and then you might go like take a nap in uh, your car in the parking lot so that you don't have to go home because you know your mom's going to be awake. But then you just keep going like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. gives me the fucking heat. I know. Jeez, Thank God. I never, about, you know, for the more of the, the crazier stuff, actually not true. Like when <laughs> I've had a crazy time, but I, I've, I've been in those places where you just kind of like post up watching TV and you're just like going in mm -hmm. or whatever it is. Um, it's. It's really, 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 really nuts um, to realize how you start to lose control. And, you know, like it almost feels like your body needs it, mm -hmm. right? And like, you can feel it in your blood, like the leftover, but you could also feel in your blood that it's not fully full. Mm -hmm. So you gotta go get more, Yeah. right? And it's just, it's, it's, it's so crazy how, how it just starts to like, really 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 pull you down and that's all that matters yeah. you know what i mean and, and you don't really uh care about much of anything else yeah. right and you just overindulge right and, and you just fucking latch on yeah and, and it's crazy because it's not free right so you're like you're killing your bank account right and i've never seen it like for me it was so weird like i'll go and i've had some friends so i don't really like i've never really like purchased blow like that but i've had it like mm -hmm. we're in the mix so i'll see like whatever, you get a couple grams of weed and it's like, wow, this is so much weed, right? And then you yeah. get like blown, you're like, bro, what's happening here? What am I gonna do with this little bit? 
<laughs> and it's like 60 bucks for however, whatever, barely a finger, mm. let's say, of, inside of, you know, a measurement of a bag. And it's just like, yeah, yeah, that's the good stuff. Right. Where's the rest of it? <laughs> <laughs> is this the sample, bro? <laughs> or is this like the full amount? And then yeah, I just don't even know. Like I couldn't even like compare how much they sell like crystal for and what does that even look like or, you know, I mean, I, I think when I was a kid, like they've showed posters, like, you know, crack is like this big, let's say, and they'll have like a couple, you know, rocks in there or whatever. But even that, I'm like, how much was that? Like, it just doesn't seem like it's a good value. <laughs> <laughs> I won't spend $7,000 for a car and I won't spend that much money for, for a block. <laughs> so I'm like, you know what? $17 for a gram of marijuana, the dispensary, that sounds fantastic. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I think um, it's important to, I think when you're in it, it's really hard to get out. And I think you don't even know how to send out an SOS. Yeah, we'll be, right? that's the thing is like, that's where like the shame and the guilt and, and all that, and you're just like, I'm fucked. You know, like how, and that's where you, you gotta oh, get real. And I wanted to, to touch on this too, because I think you can relate with this. So um, a few of my friends have been in and out of AA, and this is the part that, that, that drives me crazy, right? So like a young guy like you, you go through your stuff, you go to AA, and I feel like, yeah, there's this 12 step program thing and they all get like, it almost feels culty, right? Where we'll all read it together, you know, step one. I don't even know what the steps are, but you know, and they'll, they'll I don't want to say chant it, but everybody's like reading along, whatever. But I don't feel that they give you the necessary tools you need to become a functional person in society where it's just kind of like, well, let's just stay here and kind of share our, our feelings on a day-to-day -day basis, but yet, like, and I don't know if it's because the thing is so powerful, but you don't hear about that many people's breakthroughs. So here's you know the, what I mean? So, so, so I mean, elaborate, because you, you, you've you been to those things. I think I've went to one, but it was court-ordered, so, so that's different. <laughs> so I don't, like, I haven't done the 12 steps, I never have, um, but I do go to meetings semi-often, and I think the meetings are, are a good starting place, but I think the real, like, when you really get into the program is where you like commit and that's when you link up with a sponsor and that's like your one-on-one -on -one. and the sponsor is going to be like okay this is your work you need to do today tomorrow and this day check in with me when you're done we'll see any progress you've made like they'll they'll kind of guide you through the process and that's where the real breakthrough comes okay you can't just show up i mean i'm, I'm maybe you could but in my understanding you, you can't just show up and go to meetings and not put any effort in and think that it's gonna work. You okay. have to, you have to, that's, you know, one of the, one of their principles is like, you, you gotta give back, you know, it, and you have to pass on this knowledge and strength and, and guide other people who are struggling. And that's, that's where the real meat of it is, is where you, you learn the tools from a sponsor of how to cope and how to get through and how to live a, a manageable life. Um, and then you then in turn can do that for somebody else. Okay. And that's the process that they're working with. And Maybe that's why uh, some of my friends didn't, I mean, even probably you were guilty of it too, right? He just thinks like, hey, I'm just gonna walk in the building, show up. And that's enough. Me, right, they'll give me a couple things, we'll put some band-aids and pull them, I'm fixed again. Mm -hmm. But right. I guess, to, like you were saying, the meat and potatoes of it is more so linking up with someone who's gonna to try to pass on their knowledge of how they manage their struggles. And that's right. kind of where your, your Eureka moments come out of right. uh, of that. Yeah, I um, it's just so funny because I feel like this whole system is just set up really for you to lose, which is crazy to think, you know what I mean? I mean, there are ways to win, right? And they're, they're you know, you gotta kind of think outside the box a little bit, but I feel like with things like that, it's just kind of, people find comfortability in misery. And from the little bit of experiences that I've talked to people, it seems like them hearing other people's struggles is good enough where it's like, I'm not alone, right? Yeah. Also in like the honey boo boo stuff, right? People love reality TV, right? Mm -hmm. So if you see somebody struggling, you're like, well, okay, I'm all right. Right. That, that fool's messed up, right? right? At least I'm not the famous quote of all time, I'm not sucking dick for crack, right? right? So I'm good. And so I think you start to measure yourself against other people and maybe you don't let in 
some of those other pieces that are supposed to help you out. Right. To, to get yourself better. Is like, that's where, you know, c comparing yourself to other people is so dangerous. Because it's like, how the fuck? Like, do you even, like, there's no way to know what this other person is going right. through. Like, what, you know, who, who knows? Who knows? It's so much, it's so much better to just focus on yourself and be like, okay, what did I do today? that maybe I shouldn't have done or on the flip side of that, like what did I do today that I'm proud of myself for? That would be the better way. A hundred percent. And at the end, you know, just, just keep track of like, okay. And if you did fuck up, be like, okay, let's not do that again. But these are the things that I did really well. And this is, this is, this got, this put a smile on my face and this got me like excited. Let's do more of that. Let's do more of that. And let's build on that. And that's, I think, it's so simple, but it's not easy. Like, it's a very simple concept. Right. Like, okay, Sounds easy. this makes me feel good, right. and it's a positive. It's not like, this makes me feel good and I'm getting high, but, like, this is, like, on a substance, like, not high on life, but, like, you know, but, but this, like, I did this today, I helped somebody, or, like, I did this really complicated um, math equation at my job or, or whatever any whatever and you felt good about it after you completed it let's do more of that that's that's the answer it's that simple but it's not easy right and i mean it is and it isn't right they give you the instructions but the execution is not easy. right right, right? they give you, you step by step you can have all right. the answers right but like you gotta that's the thing is like you have to really all these and there's so many people on the internet that are like, this is how you do this, and this is how you do this, and this is how you do oh this. And it's like, 90% it's of it is bro. bullshit. Yeah, you know? a lot of it is. And I wouldn't even take it higher. It's probably like 95%. And that's where you got to really, you know, look internally and be like, okay, let me take a step back. What, what would I like my life to look like? How, how can I do that? And like, even deeper that we talked about earlier was like, why? why do I want this or why does this make me feel good? And, and if you can answer that and then you can do the what and you can put in a little bit of work every day, I think anybody's capable of doing whatever the fuck they want. Facts. I mean, you know? we were talking about earlier, like momentum. Once you start, to, right. once it starts to roll, right. it becomes easier. But yeah. The initial like startup is what really you right. know, takes, takes so much. It's so funny because I'm coming up on my, Almost my anniversary of being sober, you know, not to mock you, but uh, being sober for like two months. Okay. Right. So I think somewhere in February I started, I think it was after the Super Bowl, which is crazy. Right. So this is a very interesting story. Last so last year, yeah, last year I'm by myself. I didn't want to watch the Super Bowl with anybody because I don't really like people interrupting me. And I'm a huge fan of Tom Brady. And usually when you watch Tom Brady, you have all of these haters. Right. So I wanted to watch the game. I felt that he was gonna lose, mm -hmm. and I wanted to watch the game if he lost by myself without nobody just talking shit. Right. So I watched the game, and it was by most people's concept, it was a horrible game. But to me, it was an amazing game because you seen one guy get murdered over and over and over. I mean, I think last year's Super Bowl is the quintessential blueprint of how you should live your life. In the sense of, we were talking about this earlier. If you took five shots to the face, but it was three more shots that got you over the mountain, but you like quit at five, you didn't even get to grow and really see, right. you know, I think there's a lot of movies that do that, right? Like they're at the journey yeah, and then they're like, they quit and it's like right around the corner, wherever they were trying to get right. to or whatever. So I'm watching this and I'm seeing this guy just get holes and get like sad and boy just keeps on getting up and going and going and going. And like towards the end of the game, not only did he win, but he puts together this great drive and you get to see perseverance. And right there, I almost cried, right? Which is crazy. I get really, weirdly sentimental and i was trying to explain this to my wife i think that men worship other men right because when they have their eureka moment it's it's so easy yet so difficult to understand that when you see other people get it so easily when you see like greatness that it blows you away and so it blew me away i was like wow this dude could have given up anytime during this three-hour game and he stuck with it and he stuck with it and he ended up winning. And right there in that moment, I said, you know what? If this fool, and I, 
I think he's not a fool, but this guy, right? Like I'm, I'm, I'm like comparing myself to like one of the greatest athletes of all time. If this guy can beat this team, I can stop drinking and I can stop smoking and I can stop whatever it is else that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And that why was just so powerful enough for me that I stopped. And cold turkey, no Nicorette, no patch. Um, I didn't weed myself off. No, I think I, I, I was so lit. I think I might have seen you that night. I don't know if you were working. I was. But I was shit face and I was by myself. I mean, it was just a couple of course lights and some bud, but I already got the perfect mixture to send me to outer space. And I remember the next day and I was just like, that was it. Like in my mind, the conviction had came in. And to follow it up about the good thing, it was the first time that I could ever remember that I celebrated my birthday sober, right? That's what I was telling you earlier when you were talking about your birthday. When you're trying to quit, it's probably a dangerous idea to do it around the birthday time because it's so funny as you're an adult, birthday is synonymous with getting wrecked. Right. Right? Even 21 is synonymous with be blacking out. Mm -hmm. And for me, um, I was with my wife and my kids and we were at a trampoline park and I couldn't have felt more better. I mean, I laughed like I never laughed before. And it was right. Like, it was great to have inspiration and the why and being able to enjoy myself sober. I think that is a, a thing that we need to start to learn how to practice more and more and more as former whatevers in this game of drugs and addiction about doubling down on happiness and good times when you're sober. Yeah. Versus, you know, chasing the other happiness party. with only being fucked up right yeah well this was fucking awesome yeah this it was, was great how long was this yeah. i don't even know man but this was yeah yeah awesome. we gotta we gotta definitely do this again i gotta yeah. get you on, uh, on on my podcast but yeah. uh really excited for you bro and, and happy that you know you're finally you know doing and pursuing what you want to do when pursuit so in any way possible you know i'm here and, and would love to help you in any way oh, thanks yeah. for inviting me out yeah of course man um well that wraps up this episode um but we're gonna have to have you back on here again because this this was just a phenomenal conversation. Yeah, I, I, it's all over so, the place um, for me. So yeah, thanks everybody for listening, and um, we'll see you next time. Sweet. If anything, tomorrow, what are you doing tomorrow? Uh, I'm gonna be the product all day. <laughs> <laughs>